Welcome to our online video series, Reading Hope in Trying Times. Our guest today is our good friend, Jana Reese. Since 2008, Jana has been an editor in the publishing industry, primarily working in the areas of religion, history, popular culture, ethics, and biblical studies. From 1999 to 2008, she was the religion book review editor for Publishers Weekly and continues to write freelance articles and reviews for PW, as well as other publications. Jana also blogs for a religion news service. She's the author, co-author, or editor of many different books, including Flunking Sa Sainthood, A Year of Breaking the Sabbath, Forgetting to Pray, and Still Loving My Neighbor, What Would Buffy Do, The Vampire Slayer as a Practical, excuse me, The Vampire Slayer as a Spiritual Guide, Mormonism for Dummies, and The Writer's Market Guide to Getting Published. Another book, The Twibble, all the chapters of the Bible in 140 characters or less, now with 68% more humor, won first place in the nonfiction category in the Writer's Digest Annual Self-Published Book Award. Jan has also been interviewed by the Associated Press, Time, Newsweek, People, the Boston Globe, USA Today, Los Angeles Times, and many others, as well as Voice of America, the Today Show, MSNBC, and NPR's All Things Considered. I'm also happy to say that Jana has been interviewed by us before and has been a featured speaker at our conferences. So it's wonderful, as always, to have you here with us today, Jana. Thank you. It's great to see you again. Hello. So maybe you can start by telling us, you know, how the um, health crisis has impacted you and how you've been reflecting on this uh, from a society perspective. Mm. Well, I think we're really lucky in many ways, we've been healthy. The, the crisis has not hit Southern Ohio with the same severity that it's hit you in New Jersey and um, you know, certainly New York, New Orleans. But I do sense that it's coming. You know, we, we have had more time to prepare and I'm grateful for that, but uh, that's, that doesn't mean that the virus is going to leave us alone. As for how it has affected us personally, I would say that it's been a hard time for me as an extrovert, and I didn't quite realize just how extroverted I am until couldn't go anywhere, couldn't see anyone. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an academic and an editor, right? So I tend to spend a lot of time just sitting with a computer or a book by myself. But I also am able with my life to change it up and be um, involved with other people and going to conferences a lot. Yeah, so that part of it has been challenging. We're empty nesters now. My husband and I are knocking around in our house together and he's been working from home for the last two months. We're both really grateful to have jobs. He works as an engineer though in the aviation industry and that has been hit very hard, and um, the company that he works for is laying off 25% of their workforce. Hopefully that will, you know, not affect us, but how can we not feel, you know, afraid or, you know, very compassionate for the people who are going to be losing their jobs? That's a quarter of their workforce, and there's a lot of, of, uh, a lot of uncertainty, so. Wow. Yeah, but we're okay. I mean, <laughs> in the midst of this, for us, it's been, we, we started a list of missing, and we started that in March, just as things began to be canceled. I think for, for me, actually, the first thing that I was planning to go to that was canceled was the Calvin Festival of Faith and Writing. They came out pretty early and um, decided they, they were going to shut that down. So that was one of the first things on my list. And the list includes the kind of big things, and that it also includes really really small things that we miss doing. And I hope that we will have the spiritual maturity at some point to look at that as a list of gratitude once those things are back in our lives. We'll see. We'll just appreciate them all the more. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's a great idea to make a list like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we're adding to it. <laughs> yeah. There's something day by day and week by week and month by month, there's more things that um, <clears throat> get canceled or postponed or what have you. Yeah, we, we were um, just talking 
uh, a few minutes, a little while ago, and my husband asked me if we had anything scheduled for tonight, and this is the only thing that I had on my schedule for tonight. And then I looked at the calendar and said, oh, actually, we're supposed to be flying back from Calgary tonight because oh. he and I, um, I was supposed to speak in Calgary this past weekend, and he was going to run a marathon while we were there, and then we were going to return from this long weekend on, on Monday, so getting back into Cincinnati this evening, and obviously we're not doing that. And there's always that little pang, like, oh, yeah, that's the life that, um, you know, that we planned. And that's just, it, it certainly makes you realize how ephemeral so many of these things are. I had speaking engagements for 75% of the weekends in April, May, and June. And now, of course, I have zero wow. engagements. And so you, you just, you can't, um, you can't define your identity by those things. You, you can't, I mean, they're enjoyable things, and I'm grateful that I get to do them in that other life. But if you're getting your, your core sense of who you are as a child of God from that kind of bustling about and, and affirmation, that's not a really healthy thing. Sure, sure. Well, missing opportunity to stop by Banff is it's definitely a missed opportunity. There's no that question was about on that. Our list. Yeah, um, we've never been to that part of Canada before, so I mean, we'll oh, just my. go again. And in fact, um, my uh, the, the airfare they refunded it just as a credit for the airline. So I have two years in which to go and do that speaking engagement some other time. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be able to arrange that. Well, let me highly recommend that you spend some extra time to wander around Banff because it's one of the most beautiful places on this planet. Mm -hmm. My wife and I have been out there two different times and just absolutely love it. That sounds wonderful. So later on, I can make some more recommendations when you're ready for it. Okay. <laughs> when it's not just like a knife in the heart. Right, right. So uh, okay. one of the things we've been talking about during these interviews is how God's helped us through trying times in the past and uh, you know, how we might be able to draw on that now. Mm -hmm. Well, I turned 50 in December, and in, pre in, in preparation for turning 50, I did 50 reflections that I posted to a small group of friends on Facebook of you know, some sort of memory or vignette from every year of my life. And that was a great thing to do. I mean, as a practice to really sift through those memories. And I was struck as I started posting these that some of them were pretty vulnerable and uh, transparent about difficult things that had happened to me or that, that I had gone through. And in the end, this wonderful sense of strength and capability is what I felt at, at the end of that, of turning 50 with uh, things that I've learned, of, of things that I have coped with in the past. I don't want to go there again, right? I mean, I don't want to experience those same things again, but I wouldn't trade them either. Um, I think this is probably going to be remembered for billions of people as one of those times we will forevermore look back on as a defining moment. Um, the question is, is it going to make us better or is it going to make us worse? And on my more pessimistic days lately, I'm not feeling that, uh, I'm not feeling that we're taking that question seriously enough as a society right now. I worry about that. There is a sense in which as Christians, we ought to be modeling the, the notion that we are the body of Christ. I mean, if anything could demonstrate to us that we are the body of Christ more so than a virus, I can't imagine what it is. This is something that affects one person and then it affects 10 people. And if we want it to affect people in a positive way, we have certain guidelines that we have to follow. And um, the fact that people are not doing that or that they are seeing it as a restriction of their religious freedom blows my mind, frankly. Yeah, I hear you. And I couldn't agree more. And it's just kind of unbelievable how this is just showing the selfishness, lack of self-discipline, you know, the lack of caring for the people. Um, yeah. 
you know, at least by some segments, you know, so, mm -hmm. unfortunately much more um, prevalent than what one would wish. But anyway, on a happier note, <laughs> what kinds of things do you have to suggest, uh, you know, that will help people, Dif different books, resources, spiritual practices, you know, whatever you would like to, to, to convey that can, can give folks a little bit of hope and support in this time? I probably overprepared for this question because I got so excited about the thought of thinking about what, what can we read during this time that will help. Well, good. And so the first one is, I know you've interviewed Barbara already. This is yes. Walk in the, in the Dark by Barbara Brown Taylor. And I got this out maybe a month ago or so, and I hadn't looked at it in years. I mean, I think I had, I had read part of it when it first came out, but not, um, not looked at it since then. And it seemed to me to be the perfect thing for this moment. And so I wanted to read just this little bit from, from the beginning of this book. Again, this is um, Learning to Walk in the Dark by Barbara Brown Taylor. And she says that we, we have this aversion to darkness, and that's a natural, even a biological thing. Um, she says, it is enough to say that darkness is shorthand for anything that scares me, that I want no part of, either because I am sure that I do not have the resources to survive it, or because I do not want to find out. The absence of God is in there, along with the fear of dementia and the loss of those nearest and dearest to me. So is the melting of polar ice caps, the suffering of children, and the nagging question of what it will feel like to die. If I had my way, I would eliminate everything from chronic back pain to the fear of the devil from my life and the lives of those I love if I could just find the right night lights to leave on. At least, I think I would. The problem is this. When, despite all my best efforts, the lights have gone off in my life, literally or figuratively, take your pick, plunging me into the kind of darkness that turns my knees to water, nonetheless, I have not died. The monsters have not dragged me out of bed and taken me back to their lair. The witches have not turned me into a bat. Instead, I have learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light things that have saved my life over and over again, so that there is really only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. Isn't that great? You know. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> so one of the things that I've been thinking about, what are the things that I'm going to learn during this time that I would not ever have the opportunity to learn otherwise? Cool. Yeah, really. That's a great thing to, I mean, maybe that's going to be um, uh, source material for a book for you. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if I can ever get back to a coffee house. You and I were talking uh, earlier about how I've realized during this time that I tend to do any sort of sustained book writing in coffee houses airports and libraries and there's something about that experience of being with people but not sort of interacting directly with them but having the comfort of them all around that I need somehow when I'm writing and I haven't really been able to to write much I wrote one article for a journal basically here plus my regular short columns for RNS and that's basically it for the last two months since we've been quarantined well hopefully you'll have a chance soon to be able to you know modify your um, environment uh, appropriately. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, we could set up like dummy people. <laughs> pretend that they're all in a coffee house and, you know, doing whatever. Yeah. And pipe in a little bit of background noise. Yes. Well, it helps to be married to an engineer, you know, if you need stuff like that. You just there you go. write out the specs and then they make it happen. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. What else have you got? Right. Okay. This is a tiny little book called The Quotidian Mysteries by Kathleen Norris. So Kathleen Norris is well known for um, her, her spirituality work on monasticism. And, you know, this is, I think, one of her earlier books. Yeah, I'm not sure when this was. She's most famous for her book, Dakota, A Spiritual Geography, and also wrote The Cloister Walk. 
So this is the Quotidian Mysteries, and it's basically a whole book about doing the laundry, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> doing the dishes, um, and what kinds of things we can take from that, and what we learn about God from these sorts of everyday quotidian things. And what I love about this book for right now during this time is that we're home. You know, a lot of us are home more now than we probably ever have been in our adult lives. We're cooking all of our own meals. Some of us are discovering baking bread, which can be wonderful and great. But there's really no end to this particular daily round of it. And that's what's hard about housework. And it's also what's very much like God about housework. Um, she talks about housekeeping as an attempt to bring order out of chaos. And then she, she mentions that this is what God is doing right from the beginning of the Bible. When God clothes Adam and Eve, you know, just right from the get-go, God is the housekeeper. And she says, um, the liturgy, so the like liturgy, the work of cleaning house, draws much of its meaning and value from repetition from the fact that it is never completed, but only set aside until the next day. Both liturgy and what is euphemistically termed domestic work also have an intense relation with the present moment, a kind of faith in the present that fosters hope and makes life seem possible in the day to day. So that's very interesting. I mean, would our relationship with staying home be different? Would it be more spiritual if we could understand it in these terms like the daily offices. So, you know, monks gather several times a day. They're going to be praying the Psalms. They're going to do it again tomorrow. You know, join us this time, same bat time, same bat channel, right here. We're going to be saying the Psalms. But housework is like that too. You do laundry, you're going to be doing laundry again next Tuesday. You make dinner, you're going to be doing that again tomorrow. And how can we imbue those sacred with those household rhythms with the sacred rhythm of what it means to be people of God. So that's something I've been thinking about a lot. Beautiful that's little really, book. You can read them. Like that's really great. I, uh, Kathleen was one of our um, interviewees for this series too. Oh, I will and, have to watch that one. I'm yeah. We didn't even think it. about talking about this topic though. That would, you know, would have really been excellent. You should have her back. I should have her back. Talk about the laundry. <laughs> That's a great idea. I will. I will do an interview about laundry with uh, Kathleen. <laughs> and, and maybe I'll ask you to come back and or a couple of other folks to talk about it too. I don't know. You don't want me to do that because I wouldn't be able to speak. I'd be like, oh, you're Kathleen Norris. I went to a retreat uh, a few years ago where she had come to Cincinnati and was was doing a small retreat for writers. And I did overcome my nerves enough to at least, you know, introduce myself and but yeah. Oh, she's wonderful. You'd love speaking with her. Yeah. She'd love speaking with you. Believe me. <laughs> her writing is like poetry. Okay. So kind of along those lines, this next reading, th there are four readings. So this is the third of four in case you're one of those people who needs to know how long is she going to be talking about? This? <laughs> We're almost done. So this is Madeline Lengo, my favorite writer of all time. And it's an excerpt from the rock that is higher story as truth. This is from the chapter uh, about the Lord's Prayer called Story as the Lord's Prayer. And she's thinking about that line from the Lord's Prayer about um, daily bread. So give us this day our daily bread. This is another thing that I've been thinking about a lot because for church, what passes for church in our lives these days, since my church is now almost entirely canceled, is that we go to the Episcopal services of my husband's church and we are saying the Lord's Prayer every week in a way that my tradition does not do. So I'm thinking about the Lord's Prayer more than usual. And she says, give us this day our daily bread, not next year, not tomorrow, today. This is how I feel about a vaccine. Please give us a vaccine, not next year. Not <laughs> there you today. go. Jesus is emphatic about the importance of the present day without over-concern for the morrow. My grandmother was fond of quoting, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Scripture reminds us of the beauty of the flowers, beauty that they cannot work for or earn, but which is given to them by a loving creator who will take care of us if we are not over anxious 
about the morrow, thinking that we have to take care of it, do it ourselves. Like many people, I have a tendency to project. As a storyteller, I am trained to say, what if? But while this is important for story, it can be crippling in real life. If I'm too worried about what may or may not happen tomorrow, I cannot concentrate on what is happening today. Sometimes when we are caught up in a tragedy, we're better, better able to live in the moment than when things are going along normally. Um, so a couple things that I like about this. I also have a tendency to project and to perhaps indulge in anxiety that's not productive anxiety, you know. And during COVID-19, especially in the earliest weeks when I was basically Googling symptoms, Googling death rates, you know, every day, this was prominent in, in my life and I think really interfering with my ability to um, communicate with God or understand myself very well. So that's the first takeaway for me is that um, projecting our anxiety about the future is potentially crippling. And then the other is that sometimes she says, when we're caught up in a tragedy, we are better able to live in the moment than when things are going along normally. So I don't know if that has been true for you, but I'm hyper aware now of every aspect of spring unfolding around me, for example. Um, have you experienced? Oh, absolutely. My goodness. Yeah. I mean, paying attention to minor details that I didn't pay attention to before about, you know, when this bush flowers or, you know, the temperature isn't where mm -hmm. it's supposed to be in my mind or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of, my wife and I both are obsessed over that a little bit more than what we normally would. Yeah. Right. And, and I find also connections with friends I've had the ability for years now to Zoom with friends all over the world, but I don't typically do it. Um, and now I've been making that a priority. So I've gotten together with friends from various parts of my life and had wonderful conversations where we can see each other. We had a, a med school graduation for one, the, the daughter of one friend um, over Zoom and things like that of, of consciously being present in the moment. Uh, for each other in a way that maybe we would have let slide before. So there are gifts to be found in this time, um, if I can remember to, to not project and not be overly anxious. No question. No question. I think I mentioned to you, I mean, being, just the fact that I've been doing all these interviews has been like a forcing function for me, you know, to be able to have these conversations with people that I typically wouldn't have. Mm. It's just so wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're doing that. I'm glad we're having this conversation at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, same with us. You know, we haven't had a chance to, you know, be together at a conference or, you know, even talk much on the phone for a while. So just the chance, you know, that we're, this is bringing us to do that again is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the What's last your fourth book. The fourth one is my favorite book by Lauren Winner. This is one that um, hasn't gotten maybe as much play as Girl Meets God. This one is called Still, Notes on a Mid-Faith Crisis. And it's truly beautiful. So this came out apparently in February 2012, or so the galley spine tells me. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about during this time has been, you know, what can I take from this? Like I mentioned before, what might I be learning from this time of darkness? And then another thing has been, why am I not thinking about those things more? You know, um, I am conscious of the fact that I'm not living up to my own ideals in a way that I perhaps, I don't know. I tend to bust my own chops a lot. I'm a one on the Enneagram. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been busting my chops. And this little section of the, the book still is about failure. And I found this to be helpful. She says, um, it turns out the Christian story is a good story in which to learn to fail. As one of my colleagues has written, some stories feature heroes and some stories feature saints, and the difference between them matters. 
Stories told with heroes at the center of them are told to laud the virtues of the heroes. For if the hero failed, all would be lost. By contrast, a saint can fail in a way that the hero can't, because the failure of the saint reveals the possibilities of forgiveness and the new possibilities made in God, and the saint is just a small character in a story that is always fundamentally about God. And then she says, I do not think I am a saint, but I'm beginning to learn that I am a small character in a story that is always fundamentally about God. Very cool. So, yeah, I think that we need to come to grips with the fact that we are going to fail many times during this crisis. Right now, um, one of the things I've been listening to during the pandemic while I walk the dog is uh, Eric Larson's new biography of Winston Churchill. And I mean, it's it's really beautifully written as is everything he does for popular history. But also what comes through is how, on the one hand, how strong a leader Churchill was, how perfect he was for the times in which he um, rose to power. And then on the other hand, how many times and how rather spectacularly he failed. Um, that has been very interesting and in the end kind of hopeful to hear because I feel, you know, we are all groping in the dark, both personally and nationally. Um, I guess we need to have grace for ourselves and each other. Excellent point. And uh, he's a prime example of that. He was kind of the two extremes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. you know, really good and really bad <laughs> things happen. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Well, Jan, I just want to say thanks for joining us. And uh, as usual, you know, I learn a lot from you and I enjoy speaking with you. And so I'm really glad uh, that you were able to uh, spend some time with us today. Well, it's been my pleasure to talk about books and, and life in this un, um, unprecedented time. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, thanks again. And uh, I'm sure we'll be back in touch soon. Okay. Thanks, Brian.